So US yields and pretty much all bond yields actually are creeping higher. What does this mean for global asset prices? And then we're going to have a look at the German trade data. It's not great again. And then the trading takeout today is how to understand correlations between asset prices and economic data. Now, the only way you can get the best trading insights, education and analysis each day is if you're here every day. So hit subscribe so you can get your daily trading edge. Right. So I've got a chart here of some of the key uh, nation's 10 year government bond yields. And you can see really uh, through September and, you know, really starting from the end of August, it's pretty much been up only uh, for bond yields, which... <sighs> kind of makes sense, but also doesn't. I mean, we're, we're, we seem to be nearing the peak of the interest rate hike cycle. Um, but there seems to be other issues, you know, here, which are causing the market to think, okay, well, we need to sell off the long bonds. Now, I, I don't really have the specific reasoning, which is why I'm highlighting it. And which is why it's kind of, you know, worrying, you know, the, the the fact of the matter is that there's so many bond holdings out there today, you know, for regulatory capital even, that issues like with Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse, which cropped up at the start of the year, which were all to do with something known as duration risk, um, that can very, very easily happen again, especially as we enter a more fragile economic data environment. So the one big risk that I'm looking out for is over the next few weeks, if we do actually start to see some sort of faltering in banks, I think there's a bank in the UK called Metro Bank, which has seen its market cap drop by 98% from 2018. It's got a valuation now of only 80 million, when at the peak, it was 3.2 billion pounds, I think. And a lot of their issues aren't necessarily right now due to, you know, duration risk specifically, um, and duration risk is basically when you've got a longer dated bond um, that is held as regulatory capital uh, and it effectively loses its value. So you've got to try and hedge that interest rate risk. Many aren't or haven't done that. Um, but the issue there with, with Metro Bank is that, you know, they're trying to raise 200 million purely for a type of capital buffer if you like, even though their valuation is only 80 million. So um, they're a massive mortgage provider in the UK, massive, massive retail banker. Um, and there's definitely some concerns from my end there, more from a personal sort of finance perspective. It's very easy to switch, for example, switch bank accounts. Um, and, and it's almost like, well, there's an opportunity cost of not doing it, you know. Um, but I think there's definitely issues in the bond market at the moment. I think there's some leverage out there that's being unwound as well. And we remember this time last year in the UK, there was the uh, LDI crisis, liability driven investment crisis, which was heavily due to, you know, bond yields accelerating at a, a really fast pace. Now, if we start to see the 10 year tick above 5%, it's currently at 4.75 ish percent. Um, I think that's when we really start to see some almost algorithmic issues come into things you know algorithms are going to look at it like wow this is way past the uh, what the statistical data set su should suggest let's act on this and then they all get confused and you end up seeing problems like with the flash crash in 2011 for example or 2010 i think it was um but yeah i mean the italian bond is at 4.92 percent that spread versus the german bond so the difference in yield between the german and italian bond is pretty wide it's about what two roughly two percent now so that's that's quite big um and that's concerning as well especially from the eurozone's perspective let me just actually highlight that one so if we type in it 10 year and de 10 year we can be met with this spread so this is a concerning spread here um and if you will recall back in i think it was 2020 madame lagarde the ecb uh, president, she said, we're not here to close spreads. And the market went wild off of that. Um, it's now reaching the highest value since the start of the year. So the, the this is basically showing the cost of Italian debt is way out, out, outpacing the cost of German debt. It's, Italy has a very fragile fiscal situation as well. So 
the kind of actionable component here is really what does that mean for the euro and the geopolitical stability of the eurozone if you've got one nation which has debt increasing at a much much faster rate than another nation which is italy versus germany um, it's going to create some political instabilities especially when italy are actually looking to increase as well their deficit spending limits um it's tenuous to say the least there's a good guy on twitter called Mujtaba Rahman, who follows Europe quite heavily. And he's saying that the European Council currently is very, very split. Whenever you get splits like this and instability or uncertainty, it means the currency is more likely to lose its support levels. So if we were to look at the euro, for example, it's important now to really focus on, okay, uh, whereabouts could the euro be heading? Um, and there's a lot of blank space down here, basically. I mentioned it last week. Um, I would not be surprised to see the euro start ticking towards parity again. Um, when you do start getting a lot of calls for it not to, so there's going to be people out there saying, no, the euro won't go to, go to parity. It's, it's only 500 ticks away. That's when you start saying, okay, it's really going to go to parity. <laughs> so you want to fade the people who just don't understand the structural issues of the eurozone. But yeah, the bond yield situation at the moment is concerning. The actionable component is focusing on Europe and that disparity between Italian debt and German government debt. I'm very, very sorry. It just doesn't get better for <laughs> the eurozone or Germany. Um, German export and import data came in today, and the month-on-month -month number was negative 1.2% versus expected negative 0.4%. Uh, so that's a big, big miss on uh, the German export data. Imports no better, showing a weakening of demand. Negative 0.4% versus expected 0.5%. And that weakening of demand is very, very important because it's showing that the German consumer is quite broken, um, but also that German exports aren't being, I guess, demanded as much. Um, obviously, you know, German production is a massive, massive part of their economy, but it's been decimated since the issues with Nat Gas and Russia have come about. Um, because, you know, you've got firms like uh, BASF moving out, a massive, massive chemical company had, you know, a few square miles of factory, um, which they just closed down and moved, I think, to China. Um, you've seen the collapse in German car production. I think I've, I've got data here, actually. Um, Germany car production. So since 2016, German car production has actually been, you know, collapsing. Um, some might say that's due to Brexit. It's completely not. But you can see that it's really, really going through a tough time. And it's not spoken about enough. Germany really, really isn't spoken about enough as being such a large export-driven economy, but having its own idiosyncratic issues to the wider global economy. Um, what I mean by that is Germany is having its own isolated issues. This isn't just a factor of the global economy affecting Germany. Um, I think for a long time there were political reasons as to why Germany was cozied up to Russia a little bit in terms of being able to get that cheap natural gas. That is what gave them the boost. You know, the Eurozone and uh, the introduction of the Euro gave them a fantastic uh, way to increase their export-driven economy across the block. You know, they're already a powerful nation. Um, and th there are disparities with how the Euro is priced between different countries. So, for Italy, for example, the euro is quite under, uh, sorry, overvalued versus Germany, where it's undervalued, um, which you know gives them almost like a artificial stimulus all the time. So the fact that German production is going will be a concern to the whole block. And again, it kind of goes together with how German politics is going at the moment with uh, Alternative for Deutschland. Um, being the second largest party now in Germany um, after the CSU, I think it is, which is um, which is Olaf Scholz's party, um, and so you know it's it's really really troubling as to what's going on for the whole block because it just appears very divided, kind of tacitly. You know, they all shake hands at the meetings and 
the parliament, etc. But from a trading perspective, it just gives fantastic geopolitical instability, even if it is silent. And when there is geopolitical instability that is quite tacit and you know undercover, it gives great trading opportunity because you have to read between the lines more than what other people will uh, be able to do. So this is kind of why I'm here, you know, to help you read between those lines at the end of the day. Um, and I just think that maintaining the offer on the euro, it, it just makes perfect sense, especially with where US yields keep going, especially with the strength of the US economy uh, still as well. You know, it's weakening, but it's still stronger relatively than most other economies. So it's always going to be a euro story here. You know, the structural issues with the euro uh, will not allow it to breach prior cycle highs, basically. Um, it, it just can't. It's it's unfathomable. So um, if you're bearish the euro, I would tend to agree with you. You know, there's probably a nice probabilistic bet there that you can take. Um, of course, nothing's a certain thing. All the issues could be fixed overnight. You never know. Um, but I would obviously take the other side of that trade as well. <laughs> So one thing that I used to do when I first started out was to try and understand how different pieces of economic data, how different assets, you know, different correlations, even indicators would work together to kind of let me understand, you know, how things worked at the end of the day is the best way to put it. How the ecosystem of financial assets and data, et cetera, coexisted. And I think one of the best ways to do this is literally just to throw random stuff at a chart and see then after a while, if you keep doing this, what sticks. So we've got a German car production from the video earlier just here. Um, let's throw up, you know, Italian bond yields. Let's throw up, uh, do, 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 I don't know, um, Euro USD. Let's throw up, what else can we put here? Um, I don't even know. This is why it's so beautiful. Let's do ISM manufacturing if that comes up let's do united states manufacturing why not uh don't want prices let's go for new orders so we do a new price scale there so you can probably notice something here especially with the ism manufacturing and the uh the the german car industry okay there's probably some form of cyclical behavior that you can look at. I've never put these two together before, by the way. But you can see here, here's uh, the ISM manufacturing new orders. You can see that decrease right from 2017. And German car production was also decreasing. German car production has never recovered. ISM uh, new orders have probably some base effects in there. So base effects are when you dip so low that any increase... Uh, or expansion is going to look better on a percentage basis. But, you know, this kind of could lead you to the conclusion that from 2017, we were, we were experiencing a global slowdown considering, you know, German car production was dipping at the same time as US new orders. You know, um, you can also have a look at the euro. So euros in blue here, you could argue that the euro weakens whenever Germany seems weaker. You know, you can start to just pin things together. So find different data points and throw them on a chart. See what you can spot if there is anything. Make sure as well, though, that you're not using confirmation bias, that you are actually trying to see if there's cause, like put things together. Like, for example, you know, I, I would have argued there with, with my example that, you know, we were experiencing a global slowdown because U.S. new orders and German car production were both decreasing at the same rate. Problem now is that German car production hasn't uh, recovered after the pandemic at all. So, you know, this is when you can start to spot correlations breaking, start to see regime changes, which is really, really important for the macro side of things. So, yeah, you know, that's the best way to test things is just to put them there and look.